This is Derek Rose of the Houston Freethinkers, and I'm here talking to Mr. Adam Kokesh himself, recently released from Federal Lockup. How are you doing, Adam? Outstanding. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be back in the freeish world. The freeish world, indeed. And we've got lots of information to communicate with you, lots of things to catch up on you. Obviously, you've been keeping up with what's going on in the world. And let's get right to it. What's the latest that you can tell us about your case um, and what we need to look forward to as far as sentencing? Yeah, well, after four months in jail, three of which I did in solitary confinement and involuntary protective custody, I uh, pled to four charges, carrying a rifle or shotgun outside of home or business, uh, carrying uh, unregistered ammunition, having an unregistered firearm, and the marijuana possession. And it was a really difficult decision. I really didn't want to have to take the plea, but, uh, you know, when, when you don't have any other options and, and you feel like you're back into a corner, the government does a really good job of, you know, leveraging its force against an individual, and and, and I definitely felt that uh, that it was the right thing, and I'm I'm very confident in that decision. And if anything, the fact that I'm released is is uh, you know good evidence of that. Although I did not expect to be released, and that was a huge surprise. Uh, I was expecting to, at very 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 least, do eight more weeks uh, to go to sentencing. But the judge released me uh, on my own recognizance, and of course I have to I have to check in once a week with uh, pretrial services in D.C., but I'm also still facing charges in Virginia that i got to deal with, and we're, we're looking forward to getting those resolved as soon as possible here, but, you know, I don't know how that's going to play out, and I go back for sentencing to D.C. on January 17th, and I'm facing, hypothetically, you know, up to seven and a half years total for the uh, for those those pleas, and, of course, it would be minus time served, so I just seven years and two months, but... It's uh, you know it's it's not something that that I'm looking forward to, but it's it is something that I'm looking forward to to getting resolved again behind me, and I do think that one of the reasons that it, it played out the way that it has is because of the support from so many people who who got behind me in all of this, and and to everybody who who wrote letters to me to the judge who who left voicemails at the courthouse uh, for everybody that donated to the Legal Defense Fund to everybody that helped do media outreach and raise awareness. To people like you who came out to D.C., to came out to Virginia to help out, you know, keeping the Adam versus the Man operation going, you know, I greatly appreciate it. And it, it. It was really huge to know that I had that kind of support. I read every single letter that I got. I know not all the the mail that that got sent to me made it through. Not all the mail that I sent out made it out. But uh, the 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 amount of mail that I got while I was locked up was very very encouraging. Yeah, you definitely have a lot of support, and I was happy to come out there and help you uh, out as much as I could, man, and to try to lend support and continue the message and the efforts. And it was amazing uh, the way that your audience and people in general responded and came out uh, to support me on that. And it was it's great to see. We're happy to have you back. We've got plenty of questions that we solicited for, you know, your many fans that are curious to find out some things. Um, first of all, I want to get through the, uh, the messy stuff. There's questions regarding the money. Uh, as as many, many of your fans know by now that your business is basically stolen from you. Uh, while you're gone, and people are wondering where their money went, if it was well spent, uh, you know, who who was involved and things like that. And I know that you may be at a point where you can't really say much, but what can you offer us on that situation? Uh, we are expecting to recover all of the funds that that were uh, misappropriated, and you know, we're looking forward to getting back uh, raising funds to get Adam versus the Man relaunched. One, you know, uh, once we've got all these legal issues resolved, so that's coming together. But the last few days have been really tough for me getting out. And, and having to confront this mess that was waiting for me, you know, the, not the least of which was uh, having every all, all of my possessions, you know, everything that was in my home, uh, actually scattered between six different locations when it was all supposed to go into a single storage unit. It seems like everything that was in the storage unit was in a, a pretty messy pile. So I've been going through all that the last few days, trying to get my life sorted out, trying to get back on my feet. It's been really tough, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm I've actually got a book that I, I conceived while I was in, in jail that I'm planning on writing over the next 10 weeks while I'm kind of laying low and uh, waiting for sentencing. So I'm looking forward to being able to share that with people as well. But um, the website is secured. Uh, we, we had my father come in uh, and help out and take care of the finances and, and all the legal issues when, uh, when I was locked up. And so, uh, you know, everything on the website is secure and, and ready to go. And for people that want to donate to support what I'm doing and, and help me get me started again, I really appreciate it. We still have a lot of legal expenses. We had to borrow some money at some point in, in order to uh, to retain a lawyer for the uh, the case in Virginia. So that's still ongoing. We really appreciate all the support that people are offering on, on that hand as well. 
when can we expect you to get back to regular podcasts? <laughs> That's a great question. I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've been asking that myself and, and thinking, you know, how can I, can I do it now? Can I do it now? Can I? And, uh, you know, I, I really want to make sure that I'm doing it right this time. And I'm, I made a lot of mistakes over the last year, one of which was not being prepared for this particular civil disobedience that, that got me locked up. And, and I have to say, you know, I was not expecting a raid of my home. I was not expecting to be denied bail. You know, if, if, at worst, I was expecting to be served a warrant. And, uh, you know, I, was, I, w I would not have been surprised if I had gotten arrested and faced the charges. And in a sense, I was, I was ready for that. But to have the raid, as you know, to have a flashbang grenade thrown at my dog, to have my house turned inside out, to have uh, my girlfriend sitting in her blood for hours, all of those things, you know, I was not expecting any of that. I don't think anybody would have. But really, it, it, we, we, uh, uh, least of all, people like me should not be surprised that the government is not going to follow its own rules, especially in circumstances when someone is, is trying to challenge its power. And that, that uh, you know, it's going to make it as messy as possible every step of the way. So we're, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping mid-February is going to be really, really the earliest possible, unfortunately. Uh, un until I go through sentencing, like I said, there's a, a certain chance that I'm, I'm going to go back to jail for, for nothing else than, than what's already transpired. And, uh, you know, I, I really want to be, be uh, you know, respectful of people who, are, who have donated to support Adam versus the man and, and not get ahead of myself and try to start, you know, going off half cocked with the production when, you know, they, they could still put me away. So I got to wait until that happens. I got to wait till January 17th at least to get started on this. And I got to wait until the case in Virginia is resolved before I really commit to anything and, uh, you know, get back to hiring a, a production staff. So that's coming, and people have that to look forward to, but it, it's certainly going to be a while at, at the very least. And that's, that's assuming everything goes as, as well as, as it could possibly go. Yeah. Well, in light of all that, do you have any regrets, or do you still feel that civil disobedience is a worthy tactic? Well, the object of my activism has always been to get people to think. And there are better and worse ways of doing that, and, and I'm not in a position yet to really debate the tactics, if you want to, you know, call it that. I, sometimes I think that that what I do is, you know, is, is more performance art than anything, you know, to stimulate thought and, and to get people thinking. And, and and we certainly achieved that. I'm glad that there were a lot of people that that took this as a teachable moment. Yeah, definitely. And also, while you were locked up, you discussed running for president in 2020. Do you still plan to do that, and do you feel that's consistent with other parts of your message, which have been more agorist and, uh, you know, fighting outside of the political realm? Absolutely, and uh, we're going to be really looking forward to putting that campaign together in terms of uh, running for president on the platform of an orderly dissolution of the United States federal government. I don't think it's contradictory to agorism to to seek a, a political solution when your political solution is really an anti-political solution. And I, I've said this, uh, you know, repeatedly, that, you know, the, the libertarian movement, the, the, the agorist or, or the voluntarist movement, it's not a political movement. If political, it means solving problems with government, we're the anti-political movement. It's about solving problems peacefully through voluntary exchange. And if one of the ways we, um, we, we, we make that happen is by going, hey, let's, let's have a consensus here. You know, like, let, let's at least use the system to, to you know, to, to have an orderly dissolution as opposed to the alternative, which would be a, perhaps a violent, tumultuous, possibly uh, dangerous, and, and, you know, uh, one that would really pull the rug out from underneath a lot of people who have become dependent on government. And I think if you can, you can, I, I've never, uh, I've never said that political activism in the sense of, uh, ru you know, running for electoral office was not productive. I think a lot of times it is when you propose that that is going to be the solution. But if it's a means to reduce violence and reduce coercion in society, I wholeheartedly support it. And I think that this is the time for really bold solutions. And the more the government screws up, the more enemies it makes, the more people it hurts and disadvantages between now and 2020, I think the more people are going to be looking forward to uh, a, a bold solution such as this. And this doesn't even have to change anybody's idea of what government is or has to be, and that's one of the cool things about this platform, is that a lot of conservatives or liberals or even moderates could get on board and say, you know what, without the federal government, my state and local governments could serve my needs a lot better. And I think that's a really cool way to bring people together. But there's something that's, that's really missing from the libertarian movement as a whole, from those of us who see a stateless, peaceful society as the end goal, and that's the how. 
And while I was in jail, I read uh, For a New Liberty by Murray Rothbard. And it's, it's a great book, and it, it, it lays out the academic case very thoroughly. But the end is, the solution is activism and education. And both of those things are directed at changing the paradigm. And I, I, I don't dispute that those are absolutely essential, that, that that's really the foundation of any kind of social change, is the change in the way that people think. And that's happening, you know, with or without activism, with or without libertarians, libertarianism is growing because people are getting smarter, people are getting better educated with the internet, they're becoming more aware of what government is and does, and they're becoming uh, better able to express preferences for non-coercive relationships. So you know, I feel that that's kind of the, the destiny of the species, to, to realize these things, to get past the racket of solving problems by force and coercion. But one of the things, that's the thing that, that I would say is really missing is the how we get from A to B. And you can say, well, we're going to change the paradigm, and, and then what? You know, then, then everybody's going to use bitcoins or, or gold or silver back to independent currencies, and then the government's not going to be able to do anything. But that, that still suggests, a, a, again, a, a rather violent and, and, and perhaps dangerous transition period. Whereas I think when we have this realization, as, as this paradigm shift is fully realized in society, and we go, well, well, how do we do this? Localization is the answer. And if we eliminate the government from the top down, and you restore power locally, and and I'm sure someone uh, such as yourself, who's well schooled in in agorist theory and principle, knows that uh, often what you might have in a libertarian society is private property based communes, things that look like cities where there is an authority, except it's not by government and coercion, it's by property rights, it's by ownership, and it's by voluntary contract, and you would have collectives that in many ways look like city government, that accomplish a lot of the same things. Of course, you do it peacefully, you do it voluntarily, you do it by contract and by respect for individuals, not by territorial monopolies. So this localization concept also provides for a transition to those kinds of local economic collectives and communities that accomplish a lot of the things that people think that coercive government is necessary for. So we're really lucky in the United States of America to be in a position to lead the way for the world again and set an example and be the place where this kind of radical localization happens first. And it's because we have the state government structures, we have local government that people are, are actively engaged in. And we don't, we don't have, uh, you know, and, and I know there are other governments around the world that have, all of them have some sort of a geographic subsidiary structure, but none have the, the distinct heritage that the United States has of being uh, a federal government formed by the states, uh, at least in theory, right? And certainly it's, it's run away from that now, but I think that, that gives it a certain appeal to eliminating the federal government saying we're just going to restore all of that authority back to the states. But after that paradigm shift occurs, I don't think you're going to see that direction stop. You know, we have to say that this is the high watermark of government. We're going to reverse things. And I think when we reverse directions, you're going to see localization all the way down to the individual. And that's the how of how we get to a voluntary society. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that uh, the individualist method is going to seek the change. That's an interesting uh, answer, though, as far as that using, using political power to, as an anti-political solution. I enjoyed that. Another question that we had from a fan of yours was in regards to the march itself, and they they were curious as they said as a fan of yours they were inspired by the revolution and by the idea of evolution over revolution, and they felt somewhat um, you know disenchanted by the, the idea of the march of an armed march by going directly, whether peaceful or not, towards the government. Uh, your thoughts on that? Again, you know we can debate tactics and strategy, uh, you know all day, and and was it the best? particular action? Of course not. And then, you know, nothing you ever do as an activist, are you ever going to look back and say, yeah, there was nothing I could have possibly done better with my time at that particular moment. But it was a powerful idea and it, you know, it, it helped get a lot of people thinking, it stimulated a lot of thought. So I certainly appreciate a lot of the criticisms and this is one of the reasons uh, that, that I, w I didn't go forward with it, that we canceled it. Uh, you know, and, and I went and did what I did by myself because I felt like I didn't need to put other people at risk. I didn't need to 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 to, to you know have all the you know all all of the very legitimate criticisms of that particular idea. I don't think um, that that risking other people's you know criminal records or their safety was necessary to make the point. So I, I think from from what I was able to do, we we were still able to accomplish 
at least a lot of what I was hoping to accomplish with the march, which was to, you know, to, to get out and, and show what gun control looks like. And with the park police raid, in a sense, you know, we succeeded beyond what, what I even considered we, we could have possibly done. Uh, so that, that was, it was, you know, again, it was another really tough decision, especially after my arrest in Philadelphia for the false, uh, you know, felony assault charges. Uh, it was. It, it certainly seemed like it was uh, increasingly impractical as well to go forward with something like that. So I'm. I'm also very, very confident in the decision to cancel the march. That's good to hear. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about your jail time. Um, some of your your fans were also wondering if you had a chance to uh, to discuss these ideas, anarchy, liberty, and just you know solutions regarding the government with your uh, with your fellow inmates there, and if you were able to awaken any minds while behind bars. Oh, absolutely, and it was it was a great experience. Now, I was in solitary confinement for the first three months, so my communication was very limited. Now, solitary confinement is not as bad as it seems. It's not the Shawshank Redemption hole where you're in a black room and it's it's pitch black and they don't let you out at all and they slide in you know bread and water three times a day. No, I mean it's you, you get three meals a day. Although for me, at, at first, it really was. Uh, I, I hesitate to use the word, but borderline torture. For the first three days, I was in a very cold room and in minimal clothing, just shorts and a t-shirt, uh, where it was so cold that I couldn't sleep. We had the lights on 24 hours a day, no mattress, and there were ants in the cells. And, and it was, a, a, for me, a starvation diet of a sandwich and a carton of milk three times a day. I lost 15 pounds in the first three weeks I was in. But you know, after that, even when you're in solitary, you know, it's, it was relatively comfortable. Uh, I didn't get enough food for the, like I said, for the first three weeks. But uh, you know, I, nothing is expected of you. You can lay around and sleep all day or read books. I read a lot. I, you know, I wrote a lot. Uh, but when when you're in solitary, uh, when I was first in Fairfax, anyways, I could only talk to people through the walls, and I had some really amazing conversations there. And and uh, they put me right next to the the Muslim block, uh, and it was Ramadan at the time, so there were guys staying up all night praying and and singing. And I, I think, you know, as, as a Jew, they did that as a, as a little dig against me, but I made some great friends. And uh, one of them, Omid Hope, even wrote a great, uh, a great piece about what it was like meeting me in jail and how he wants us to be my bodyguard now. So I, I made a lot of great friends there as well. And then in, when I was in solitary at the D.C. jail, we were in kind of a hallway where you can, you can yell across the hallway and you can talk to people next to you. But your conversation is really limited to that, and that's where I had my, you know, 23 and one time, where they let you out for an hour a day to walk around in a slightly bigger cage, but still no sunlight. And it was, uh, you know, it was a distinct challenge, but the, the hardship wasn't really that big a deal. You know, I was in Fallujah for seven months. It was more the the uncertainty and and not knowing what's going to happen with my legal case that was really difficult. But I, I made a lot of good friends. I was able to talk to a lot of people. And then for the last month, I was in. Uh, I was in general population, and uh, I had a lot of fans. Every time uh, I went to court, they played the shotgun video on TV, so everybody knew when I was going to court. And uh, you know, guys, they were really helpful. You, you don't find a lot of uh, you know, except except for the mugger who says, "Yeah, I love being in D.C. with gun control, where all my victims are disarmed." You don't find any real you know any any real supporters of gun control in jail. So they all appreciated what I was doing. They're all very supportive, and. You know, for, for people in, in that situation, people who are the real victims of government, giving them an explanation for how we got to this point and, and how the system got set up this way and, and what it's, what's behind it and what government really is, you know, I, I, it was a really receptive audience. And there, in, a, in a sense, there, there are two components of the libertarian message. One is, you know, hey, this is how it should be. And there's uh, the other element, which is this is an understanding of how it is. And for a lot of people, you know, regardless of your political orientation, having that explanation of government, you know, can really help you understand a lot. And especially when you're going through a legal challenge where, you know, it's, it's a criminal punishment system more than a criminal justice system. It, it really helps to, to hear someone, you know, give that kind of explanation. And there, there are plenty of guys in there. Who, who acknowledge uh, the, the seriousness of their crimes and are willing to, to face a punishment. Um, but th the problem is that they're not providing restitution. They're not making their victims' lives any better. And in, in a sense, and you know this as well as anybody, when, when someone goes to jail, uh, someone who, who, say, has robbed some, somebody. Now, 
Yeah, I can say it's from my personal experience. I had a motorcycle stolen when I was in college in California, and I got a judgment for restitution against the victim for six thousand dollars, or excuse me, against the the thief for six thousand dollars. The government spent tens of thousands of dollars prosecuting him, tens of thousands of dollars jailing him, and when he went to jail for a couple of years, he didn't have to work. You know, he just got to sit around and live off the taxpayer and 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 do whatever he wanted. And I didn't see a dime of that. So and I also got doubly victimized then as a taxpayer. This was back when I was uh, still in the Marine Reserves and working on college, uh, on the college campus. I got doubly victimized as a taxpayer because then the government steals from me in order to pay for his incarceration. So for a lot of guys, that that just hearing it in those terms was like, wow. And I think I inspired a lot of guys to uh, to reach out to their victims and, and to make amends that way. And I think that was some of the, the most uh, powerful stuff that I did. But just sharing the message in general, I got sent a lot of great books from supporters that I was so grateful for that I was able to share. And, uh, you know, we, ha we had a lot of good conversations in jail, waking people up. Yeah, you definitely would be surprised. I think the average person would be surprised to the people they meet behind bars. Definitely those who maybe want to be there and others who have just gotten caught up in the system but are very intelligent, very bright individuals. Well, let me just say, question. hold on, about, about that, let me just say it was also a very humbling experience because as bad as what I was facing was, there are guys facing far worse who have been locked up far longer, you know, just on pretrial confinement. And, you know, it's, it, 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 would, it would really break my heart, but at the same time it was really inspiring to see uh, the, the triumph of the human spirit in jail, of people that are facing possibly the ends of their lives as they know it and being able to go about their day with a smile. Yeah, it's definitely, it can be a dark place, but it can also be a place that builds character and makes you stronger if you choose to, to do that. And that's what I wanted to get into next. Uh, you've somewhat been discussing, I think, through the podcast, uh, how this was a spiritual retreat. And many people are wondering if you, if you got into meditation while, while locked up. Absolutely. You're kind of forced to, you know, and maybe this is one legitimate benefit of the way the system is set up. That, that you know, there are enough times when you, it's stare at walls or meditate, you know, or walk around or pull your hair out or go crazy, or you sit and meditate. And I, I think it, it was very beneficial for me to just just to pick up on that practice. And you know, as soon as I get out here, I'm like I'm 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 all scatterbrained again, and I'm all trying to put the mess of my life back together and just get my physical property organized. And it, it really is helpful to be able to think, you know, I can just, I can, I can lay down and breathe and focus on my breathing and, and kind of get, get re-centered when, when I need to. And I, I definitely picked it up. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody ever becomes, you know, an absolute master of meditation. But I, 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 on a scale of one to ten, I took my skills from about a point two to a, a, maybe a two and, two and a half. And, you know, that's, that's, that makes a, a radical difference in someone's life to be able to have that kind of, uh, you know, self-discipline and, and, and that kind of uh, ability to just focus your thoughts. Yeah, definitely. One last question before I let you go for the day. Uh, first of all, I appreciate you taking time. I know you're dealing with a lot since, you, you know, you've just recently been released. And while you're away, the, the world's hey, man, been busy. You, I'm, I'm happy to give you some of my time. I know, I know you're, uh, I, I really appreciate what you do. I'm really happy for what you're doing with your show here. And, you know, I know, I know that you did a lot to help me out when I was locked up, but, you know, more importantly than, than any of my specific, you know, individual gratitude for, for you as a person and for everything that you've done for me, uh, I really do appreciate your perspective. I appreciate what you do, and I appreciate the, the attitude and the angle that you bring to your journalism and, and, and the way of thinking. I think uh, you're, you're an incredible asset to the movement. Well, thank you. I very much appreciate that, man. And uh, I think my personal journey, honestly, has been kind of, coinciding along with yours and we met a couple years ago in New York and then we did it again in Tampa and then New York again and then working with you so it just seems to it just seems to keep happening so it only seemed to be fitting that I co-host while you're locked up and you be my first guest on, on my show so it hopefully next time you get locked up I'll be there to help you out <laughs> yeah yeah we gotta we gotta watch each other's backs man one other thing I wanted to ask you about before I let you go is in regards to Global marches. You know, since you've been gone, the world's been pretty busy marching uh, against Syria, Monsanto twice now. There was uh, marches against corruption, the Million Veterans March, and coming this Saturday, November sixteenth, there is a new march, the March Against Mainstream Media, that is focusing on building the new independent media and really putting the nail in the coffin of the formerly known as mainstream media. 
How do you feel about uh, that topic? Well, I think it's about that topic in particular. I want to say more about the, the bigger picture, but about that topic in particular, I think it's great. And, and I don't know if it should be a march in protest as much as we should call it maybe an, an advertising campaign, you know, and, and really see ourselves as, 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 a, as businesses. And I think that's really important that, that we are serving our customers, we are serving the audience. And it's really easy to look at the mainstream media when you understand government and its relationship to the media as, you know, part of the racket and that it's just some criminal enterprise. But when it comes down to it, it's a business. If people weren't watching, there, it wouldn't work. If people weren't listening, it wouldn't have any effect. And the reason they get away with it is because there aren't better alternatives, although that's not true anymore. There are. And I think what we've done is we've really succeeded in putting independent media on the map. I don't think there's anybody who watches the news now that doesn't at least have some awareness, yeah, this is propaganda. Yeah, they're, they're really getting one over on me. But, and, and they're aware that there is independent media. But for the people that, that really want it, it's there. But for the people that are just like, no, I don't mind... You know, I'll watch the pretty babes on TV and I'll get my propaganda and my, you know, my, my high production value news. You know, they'll, they'll want that and they'll take that. I think what we need to be doing now as independent media is really stepping up our game production-wise and competing in those terms. And, and that's what I'm really looking forward to doing when, when, when I jumpstart uh, relaunch Adam vs. the Man and, and, and the podcast. But if, if I may, on, on the bigger picture about what you say about, uh, you know, all of these marches happening, the Million Mask March as well that, that happened the day before I got out uh, was, was really cool to see some of the visuals from that. Uh, now, for people in general, please, march, get active, do what you can, raise awareness, fight for your issues, please. But as, as libertarians, I, I would hope that we bring a, a, a greater awareness to protesting. And when you protest... If you're fighting for a law locally or you're fighting for awareness about a specific issue, it's, it can be a futile effort if you're not really waking people up to the one issue, which is self-ownership, the one issue, which is liberty, the one issue, which is voluntarism, of, of, of making human relations free of force, fraud, and coercion. And if you're really not waking people up to that, then it, I think what you're doing is fighting for an inch while they're taking a mile behind your back and then laughing at you. Oh, oh yeah, sure. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll get we'll get rid of Monsanto, and while while we're we're appeasing you, saying yeah, your march worked and you did a good job, we're gonna go start a few more wars. You know, like you know, what 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 good is that? And in that sense, I really think we need to be taking a sense of what what is the bigger picture, what is waking people up to to the core message of liberty. So uh, you know, all of this activism is great. I, I support all of it, but I would I would just hope that as libertarians. We see it in that bigger context, and for me, that's what's so exciting about launching this presidential campaign and talking about the issue of localization as a way to achieve a voluntary society. And it kind of, you know, it's, it's again, it's an, an embodiment of the, that, that one issue. You know, I, 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 do I want to have a rally for the media and, and for against Monsanto and for anonymous activism and for, you know, against the NSA and everything else and to stop this war and that war and the next potential war? Yeah. Absolutely, but what I really want to do is, is have a rally for self-ownership, a rally against slavery, a rally for abolitionism, and, and really get to the heart of the matter. And all of those issues contribute, and all of those get people thinking and get people more aware of the role of government. But what really does it is, is, is when, you, when you free a mind, and, and, and a mind gets engaged in a different way. But again, we got we to gotta be smarter about our activism. I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that I'm, I'm, I'm alone here. This is just one of the insights I had while I was in jail. I have to be smarter about my activism and in a way being resolved to put more towards those things that wake people up, independent media production and uh, you know, the, the kind of insertion into the political debate that, that gets people thinking in an anti-political way, thinking towards non-aggression. I think that's much more important than fighting these individual issues. So that, that's sort of my you know, free advice for the movement for what it's worth. <laughs> Well, thanks for the advice. I think that more people should take in, yeah, these, these marches, these rallies. It's good to see people get active, and I still go to them to try to network and meet other individuals to move them towards solutions, but that's where we have to keep going. We have to go past the marches and past the rallies, but for the people who are still at those points where it's serving a purpose for them, you know, keep doing it, keep marching. Uh, any, anything else you want to leave us with before we let you go? I just want to say thanks to everybody that supported me during these recent challenges, and, and just please know that I'm not out of the woods yet. I, like I said, I got... Uh, court coming up in Virginia on December 16th, and then again in in, uh, in D.C. on January 17th, and 
uh, you know, until these legal issues are resolved, I'm, I, I kind of got a, a hand tied behind my back. So I'm, I'm going to keep fighting for what I believe in. And, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep going with, with the activism. But, uh, you know, one of the things that, that uh, like I said, I, I really wasn't prepared for it. And if anything, it's, it's challenged me to, to step up my game in a way and, and be able to reach more people with the message of, of peace and, and volunteerism and, and liberty. Awesome. Thank you for talking with us. I appreciate your time.